This is the Magnavox Odyssey 2. It went head to head with the Atari 2600 and other second gen consoles, but how did it stack up? Let's take a look right now here on Retro Bits. The second generation of home video game consoles. These systems were defined by their use of microprocessors instead of discrete logic, and external cartridges instead of a fixed number of built-in game modes. Everyone knows this form factor, and while well, top billing may have gone to the Atari VCS, it wasn't the first second-gen machine to hit the market. That honor went to the Fairchild Channel F. Released in November of 1976, it was the first home system to make use of replaceable ROM cartridges. That advancement allowed this new generation of machines to grow beyond their original software base and gave them the potential for a limitless variety of games, a major leap forward in the state of the art. You're sure to be familiar with some of the other second generation consoles. Of course, there was the Intellivision and the ColecoVision, but there were also many other models competing in this emerging market, including the Vectrex, Emerson Arcadia, Bally Astrocade, and the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Odyssey, video game fun, computer keyboard challenge, the entrance to an alternate world of fire-breathing dragons, hard-hitting sluggers, arcade wizards, outer space wizards, more than 40 games in all, Odyssey, all for the price of an ordinary video game, Odyssey. Released in 1978, the Odyssey 2 arrived a year after the Atari and two years after Fairchild's console. At launch, you could expect to pay around 180 US dollars, equivalent to 860 adjusted for inflation, putting it at around the same price point as the VCS. Where I grew up in North America, the Odyssey 2 was sold under the Magnavox brand, although I never even knew about it at the time. In other markets, it was most commonly sold under the Philips name and released as the Videopack G7000 in Europe. Several third-party variants were also sold in specific geographical markets, most notably in France. The new machine carried on the legacy of the original Odyssey, the first generation being fixed ROM, table tennis, and sports-inspired games. Various models were sold in a wide variety of packaging from 1972 onward. Not only did the Odyssey bear the distinction of being the very first commercial home video game console, but it also inspired Atari's smash hit Pong, which resulted in a lawsuit from Magnavox. Despite the system's pedigree, Philips Magnavox didn't put their full weight behind the new machine, at least not at first. They nearly canceled the console several times, understaffed product development, and relegated game design to only a handful of individuals. In fact, a lone programmer, Ed Averett, was single-handedly responsible for 24 of the console's titles, about half of the entire library. Yeah, times were different back then, that's for sure. Given the lack of support, the console wasn't a huge commercial success. By the time the company realized how big the market for second-gen consoles was becoming, Atari had already locked in their position as the dominant force, outselling Magnavox 15 to 1. Despite their early lead in the industry, the Odyssey 2 was relegated to third place in sales, falling behind runner-up in television, and eventually shipping 2 million units over the machine's six-year run. Around 50 games in total were available in North America, with a slightly larger number being sold in European and Brazilian markets. The library consisted predominantly of first-party titles until late in the platform's life when companies like Imagic and Parker Brothers ported a handful of their popular games to the platform. A number of homebrew titles have also been created over the intervening years, with the latest being as recent as 2017. And here it is, the Odyssey 2, and I picked this up locally for $50 in box with a few games, which I thought was a really good deal. Now, this box is kind of ratty, maybe even quite literally, as you can see, something has clearly chewed a big hole in it. So the box itself is not in really great condition, but let's still take a look at the box art because this is really cool.
Yeah, so check this out. The graphics design firm that was hired by Magnavox for logo and packaging came up with this styling based on the theme explosive. And you can just see that here with everything flying out of the center of the screen, the text flying out of the computer. Yeah, I really love this design. It's really cool. And the neon artwork really reminds me a lot of the Epix Games boxes that came later. Stuff like Summer Games, Impossible Mission, and Pit Stop. Here on the side of the box, we have a bunch of the game artwork, again, with that explosive theme, and we have screenshots from each of the games. We also have the slogan that was used for the Odyssey 2, the excitement of a game, the mind of a computer. So they're kind of leaning into the fact that it has a keyboard and that it is sort of like a computer, even though there's no IO, there's no disk drive or cassette drive. So there's no way to store or load programs that you've written. But we've got more game artwork here on the side following that same theme. More than 40 Odyssey games are available now and new ones are on the way. So they're also saying how this is not like the game systems that came before it, that this is expandable, which is the whole novel concept of that second generation. More game art on this side and clearly we've got some mouse damage here. And on this side, we've got some packaging damage. The artwork has come right off of the box. So here on the back, we have the majority of the damage with the machine itself poking through, but we've got this promotional and marketing literature that describes the capabilities of the machine. We've got more screenshots, pictures of the joystick and the machine itself. So everything you need to know before you purchase the system. And I just absolutely love this box art and the style that they went with here. It is just absolutely fantastic. Now, I was exposed to Atari, Coleco, and in television at an early age, but this is the first Odyssey 2 I've ever seen in my life. Did you play on one of these back in the day? Given that they sold over two million of them, they must have been out there, but I suspect that they were way more popular in the European and Brazilian markets where they had over a dozen different variants of the system. Now, it looks like everything's intact here. I've got the original styrofoam. We've got the controllers here. So I'm gonna get this unboxed and then we will take a close look at the machine itself. All right, I've got it out of the box. And the first thing that I noticed right away is the disparity between the marketing and the actual device. The bright colors scream excitement, but the physical design couldn't be more different. I mean, it is a product of its time, but unlike the Atari, I don't think this look has aged particularly well. The predominant feature is this membrane keyboard, which does separate the Odyssey from some of its other contemporaries. Sure, the Intellivision had the computer module, Coleco had the Atom, but this one comes with the keyboard right out of the box. And there were about a dozen educational and application titles, including some math, spelling music, and even a few programming cartridges available for the system. Microsoft Basic was available via a home computer add-on that extended the system with a Z80 CPU and a cassette tape interface, but that was only available in Europe. Other notable features on the front of the machine include the cartridge slot here, which has no dust protection, so the elements can get right in if you're not careful. We also have this nice big red power toggle and the Odyssey 2 badge here with the words microprocessor written underneath it. Here on the back of the machine, there's not too much of interest. We have some slots for ventilation. There's a standard barrel jack connector for the 11.5 volt, 400 milliamp power brick. And we have a hardwired RF connection. This model has hardwired joysticks, but you can see here, there are placeholders for external joystick connectors that some variants had. And speaking of the controllers, here they are. These are not as iconic as the Atari CX-10 slash CX-40, but they're instantly recognizable as joysticks, unlike many of the other oddball controllers from the second generation. They have a single fire button and a spring-loaded return to center stick, which is really nice. The only unusual feature about this joystick is that it has this eight-way directional star that you can kind of lock the stick into, and it's a little awkward to use because you can't move smoothly from one lock to the next. So I'm glad that design went away with the second generation. Otherwise, these are very usable joysticks. Over the lifetime of the system, there were at least four different controller variants. Now these look identical to the hardwired controllers, but they have a standard Atari style connector. They aren't pin compatible with the Atari, but they can be adapted to work on an Atari, or you can rewire an Atari joystick to work on the Odyssey 2.
All right, so I've opened up the system and here we can see the main PCB and it is quite small relative to the overall enclosure that it's in, but that's not really a big surprise. What was interesting is that the whole system is held together not by screws, but by these hex head bolts. And you need to use a special tool to remove them because of course they are not slotted. So I thought that was neat. Let's take a quick look at the PCB and I wanna draw your attention to these traces. They're all made using 45 and 90 degree bends and they're all clearly laid out by a human, all concentric and geometrical. It's just really cool to look at. Also, the soldering job here is really good compared to my Atari Heavy Sixer that we looked at a while ago. That had some poor quality solder joints that were clearly made by a human. This looks like it was made with an automated process. I also want to call your attention to this bodge wire here. It connects the ground plane to the RF modulator, and I'm guessing this was probably done to try and improve the video signal quality. Speaking of which, the toggle switch for channel three and four on the RF modulator is here inside the case. So you have to remove the bottom cover in order to make that change, which is an interesting design decision. It's not available for the user to access outside of the case. If I flip the board over here, I've already disconnected all of the wiring harnesses except for the keyboard, which I didn't want to mess with. So what we've got here are the two joystick connectors as well as the barrel jack for the DC power. Here we've got the connector to the RF modulator and here is the connector for the power switch. We've got the voltage regulator and what I assume to be is a large smoothing capacitor. And we have a few other electrolytics on the board. All of them look to be in good condition. I don't see any signs of leaking or bulging, which is pretty typical of capacitors from the late 70s and 80s, unlike the ones we see from the 90s. Taking a closer look now, we can see that the main chips on the board have a date code of 1977, making this a pretty early example. The Odyssey 2 is powered by an 8048, one of the very first microcontrollers developed by Intel. Unlike a microprocessor, this is an entire self-contained 8-bit computer on a chip. The 8048 features an internal clock, one kilobyte of ROM that houses the Odyssey 2's BIOS, 64 bytes of RAM, and it provides 27 lines of I.O. The internal 8-bit CPU runs at 1.79 megahertz and has 12 address lines, which limits the system to only four kilobytes of directly addressable memory space. The MC48 series of microcontrollers were commonly used in embedded systems and as keyboard controllers for both musical and computer varieties. In fact, the original IBM Model F had an 8048 on board. Over here, we have 128 bytes of external 8-bit SRAM, and here is the custom sound and graphics chip, and here is the color encoder chip. This guy here is an 8244, which is a custom-made audio-video IC made by Intel specifically for the Odyssey 2. The system operates at a resolution of 160 by 200 with 16 fixed colors. It features a colored background grid, four 8x8 pixel single color sprites with collision detection, and a built-in alphanumeric character set. Sound generation comes from a 24-bit shift register inside of the AV chip that can operate at two different frequencies as well as a noise generator. I'm sure you've heard the old expression, when it rains Odyssey 2s, it uh, pours Odyssey 2s? Something like that. Anyway, just a few weeks after I picked up this first system, Another one came along just a few miles from my house. This one was a little more expensive at $85, but the box is in much better condition. I think this is a slightly newer model because they've updated the box art. It now says the Ultimate Computer Video Game System by Magnavox, so they've changed the slogan, and they've also updated the screenshots and game art on the side of the box. If we flip it over, you can now see what the back is supposed to look like without the mouse damage. They've slightly updated the artwork here, but you can see all of the text and the lovely gradient that they've used here, so this is really nice. And if we take a look inside the box, there we go. We've got some paperwork. How to get service on your Odyssey 2 after the three month warranty expires. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna have to worry about that. Nice thing about this one is it also came with the original user's manual, the RF modulators here, and we've got the system in its original plastic wrap looking to be in really nice condition. So I think overall the price point that I got this one at, the $85, was worth it because this is a much nicer system in general. Oh, and to sweeten the deal, it came with this pile of software. Now, I know that's what you guys really want to see, so I'll stop talking about box art and let's have a look at some of the games. 
First up, we have the Multimode Game Cartridge by Magnavox, and this contains Speedway, Spinout, and Cryptologic. I believe this would have been the pack and title that would have come with the original Odyssey 2. One thing to note right away is that this follows the explosive theme where the artwork is just flying out of the center of the image at high speed, and another part is the naming convention that all the games across the Odyssey 2 line had an exclamation point at the end of the game title, making it sound more exciting, perhaps. On the back, we have some screenshots of the game and the three different games that are included on this multi-mode cartridge. On the inside, we've got the cartridge itself and a small but full color manual explaining how to play the various game modes on the cartridge. Very nice. This first game mode is Speedway and it totally reminds me of Street Racer on the Atari. I'm equally bad at both. I'm not really sure how the game is drawing three cars on the screen at once. It seems like it exceeds the sprite limit. I want to say character graphics are being used here. Mode 2 is Spin Out, and this one is actually a lot of fun, as long as you've got a friend to play with. Early Odyssey games were only 2 kilobytes in size. Later, more advanced games came in 4K carts. These were marketed as the Challenger series. The Odyssey had built-in bank switching that allowed for games up to 8K in size. Later titles took advantage of this, like Popeye, Frogger, and Cuber, all from Parker Brothers. The final mode is Cryptologic, and it has nothing to do with racing. Instead, it allows you to enter a phrase using the keyboard. The letters are scrambled, and Player 2's job is to decipher the original text. I'm sure I'd have been bored with this game pretty quickly as a kid. I mean, how many ways could it possibly scramble the word fart? Next up, we have Type and Tell, part of the voice series for the Odyssey 2. You type, it talks, it's fun. Yeah, the Odyssey 2 had a hardware add-on called the Voice of Odyssey, which gave it speech synthesis capabilities, much like the TI-99 or the Intellivision's IntelliVoice. Unfortunately, my system did not come with that add-on, so I'm not going to be able to show you this game. But it looks like it has four different modes, War of the Worlds, Garble, Soundwaves, and Superstar. P.S. Invite Type Intel to your next party and see what happens. Odyssey 2. The keyboard is the key to greater game excitement. What we've got here is Invaders from Hyperspace. Once again, note the exclamation point. Science fiction becomes science fact in this realistic war of the worlds. Yep, yeah, I'm sure it's very realistic. That is not realistic, this is artwork. There's the game screenshot right there. It is a space game. Space games were all the rage in the late 70s and early 80s. Not suitable for play on black and white television. All right, let's check it out. All right, so how this works is one or two players defend their home planet from invasion. You can land on any planet that's the same color as your ship, but if you touch any other planet, both you and it are destroyed. Consequences, people. You can respawn as many times as needed, as long as you have at least one remaining world under your control. Invaders attack you, your planets, and each other. Defeat 10 of them before you lose all your planets and you win. The game is fast paced, the board is constantly changing, and a variety of strategies come into play depending on how many planets you have left and whether you like player 2 or not. All in all, this is a pretty clever game despite the modest specs of the hardware. Next up, we've got Monkey Shines, part of the Challenger series. If you remember, that is reserved for cartridges that use more than two kilobytes of ROM with the system's built-in bank switching to provide for more advanced gameplay. Computerized monkeys, unlimited action, trillions of combinations, you'll go ape. Let's take a look. So what we've got here is Monkey Tag, where you have to tag the monkeys and not get tagged by the monkeys that are it. 
And then we've got different permutations of the same thing. Tailspin, where the game board rotates. Shut eye, where the game board becomes invisible. Monkey chess, where the game board is changed as you play. And then bananas, which looks to be some permutation of all of the above. So this game is clearly taking advantage of the feature of the video chip that draws the background grid, lets you redraw the background grid in order to change the game mode to some degree. Let's take a look. To score a point, all you have to do is grab a yellow monkey and give it a toss. They're now it and will turn red and try and chase you down. If a red monkey touches you, it's game over. It's supposed to be cooperative, but chucking a monkey straight at player two and instantly ending their game would have been my favorite thing to do as a kid. And as an adult. As a platformer, this doesn't really work too well. The jumping is kind of awkward and it's almost better to let the monkeys come down to you instead of trying to chase them around the map. I think this would have been fun with two skilled players. When there are two or three red monkeys at once, it gets pretty intense, and they remain it longer and longer as you progress further into the game. Next up, we've got Alpine Skiing, exclamation point, an authentic computerized simulation of three different world-class championship events. Yeah, the world doesn't have enough skiing games. I absolutely love skiing games, even from the earliest Alpine Ski in the arcade. Can't get enough of these. It looks like it has slalom, downhill, and giant slalom. I can't wait to check this one out. Looks cool. Well, looks were deceiving. All three game modes are more or less the same. Skiing around or between gates. There are no trees, rocks, ice, or other skiers, and the course is on rails. Maybe I was expecting too much from a two kilobyte game, but there's not much fun to be had here. Moving on. Here we've got Showdown in 2100 AD. Notice this one does not have the exclamation point. Interesting. Shoot it out with other players or computer controlled androids. Okay, so we've got a gunfighting sort of game. We've got a cowboy and an android here. Oh yeah, we've got a 1v1 sort of shooting game here. Yep, <laughs> and of course, it has to be an Android because this is the late 70s and Grand Theft Auto and Carmageddon, they don't exist yet. So murdering other humans on your family TV set is probably frowned upon. We didn't have that back then. What we had is shooting androids, a little bit more palatable for the early video game consumer. I don't think I need to explain anything here, but one neat thing this game has is an AI opponent. Many of the versus type games require two human players, so that's cool. Okay, so he's not the smartest opponent, but to be fair, the ricochets are pretty extreme in this game, and shooting yourself happens more often than you'd want. It's half pinball, half Westworld, and all edge of your seat action. You may recognize the trees here as they were the flags in the last game we just looked at. There's a good reason for this. The Odyssey 2 has no bitmap graphics, so it's not possible to draw arbitrary images on the screen. With only a background grid and four sprites, games must often rely on the built-in set of 64 characters, resulting in many of them having a similar appearance. 48 are alphanumeric and symbols. The remainder are things like block, man left walk, arrow right, plane, and tree. Keep your eyes peeled and you'll see these appear again and again in many other titles. Yeah, you stay down, buddy. Baseball, it's all here even an electronic umpire. Yep, apparently even the second gen consoles couldn't escape the dreaded sports title. I'm sure it's lovely. We don't have time to find out. Football, you captain a team of realistic electronic superstars. Let's take a look at something a little bit more interesting.
Okay, so this is a lot cooler Conquest of the World Expanded Memory Cartridge Master Strategy video game. And as you can see, this is a big box game for the Odyssey 2. That's really cool. We haven't seen anything like that yet. Let's take a look inside. So what we've got here, we've got the cartridge. We've got a little cover here. And inside we've got game pieces. There are 1,500 and 100 little plastic pieces. So this has something to do with the game itself. If we remove the top here, we've got an actual real full-sized game board. So this is a board game with a computer video game component to it. So you would use those pieces here on this board and it's got all these different countries and some values and some tables here. That's neat. So what this is, <laughs> big manual, full color, very nice. Objective of the game is to lead your homeland to world domination through negotiations, conquests, and alliances. So we've got submarine combat, we've got planes, tanks, land, sea, and air. So yeah, this is really cool. What this is, is it takes the limitations of the system and expands on them by bringing it into the real world. You didn't ever see anything like this that early on. At least, I don't recall having seen something like this before. Oh, and we've got these magnet sheets here. So you clearly use these on the game board as well. A lot of these haven't even been broken apart yet. That's cool. So yeah, this is a really neat artifact. Next up, we have Pickaxe Pete, part of the Challenger series. Thrills, chills, and spills as Pickaxe Pete strikes it rich in the Misty Mountain Mine. One thing I want to call your attention to here is the price tag from Haidlofts. I'm not familiar with them, but $29.95. If this was US dollars in 1982, that would equate to 97 US dollars in 2024. So if you think paying $60 for a AAA title today is expensive, imagine paying $97 for this back in 1982. And what we've got here is a platformer. Yep, looks like a traditional platformer. I hear good things about Pickaxe Pete. I think this is one of the more popular titles for the system. So let's check it out. All right, so what have we got here? More of the same character graphics, of course. The circles are boulders that come out of the square doors. Pickaxe Pete scores points by either breaking or avoiding the boulders. Hmm, what does this remind me of? Yep, it's clearly inspired by Donkey Kong, which came out just a year earlier. Pete is basically invulnerable at first, but the pickaxe wears out after about 15 seconds, at which point you need to start dodging the boulders. You can jump as well as duck, which is a neat addition. Another axe will occasionally appear at a random point on the screen, but you only have a short time to get to it. Finding a key lets you enter any one of the doors and progress to the next level. Touching a door without a key causes Pete to get stuck for a few seconds, often long enough for a spawning boulder to do him in. The moving ladders can be frustrating, and I thought it was a weird design choice, but it makes sense when you realize the player, pickaxe, and key use three of the four sprites, so only one ladder can be on screen at a time. So this is how the developers worked around the system's limitations, and it works so much better than the platforming in Monkey Shines. All in all, a pretty fun game with solid arcade action. Here, we've got P.T. Barnum's Acrobats, the greatest show on earth, straight from Ringling Brothers' Barnum & Bailey Circus. So this is the first licensed property that we've seen on the system, maybe one of the only ones. It's part of the Challenger series, and it's voice enhanced. Unfortunately, without the enhancement module, we will not be able to hear what that sounds like. It looks like it's an acrobatic style game with 18 game variations for one or two players. All right, let's take a look. Bounce your acrobats up so they can pop the balloons, and don't let them fall. Simple. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, dude. You know what this is? It's a variation of Breakout. <laughs> I love that you can launch the guy way off the screen.
there are a few different game modes. In this one, a platform appears at random. It can either help you or mess you up. The joystick control is a little difficult, it would have been easier with paddles. Next up is Freedom Fighters. Rescue prisoners of the Pulsars from Deep Space Confinement Crystals. And this is another one of the Challenger series using expanded memory. Let's take a look here at the box art. If I had to guess, it's another space game. This looks a lot like Defender, if I had to guess. Did Defender come out before 1982? Let me take a look. Yep, Defender came out in 1981, so I'm guessing this is a clone of that. Let's see if I'm right. Okay, yeah, this is kind of Defender-like. The action only takes place on a single screen, though. The game bills itself as a two-player. The second joystick controls hyperspace. Unlike Defender, you don't actually warp anywhere, the ship just moves a bit faster. Ah, this also scrolls the screen, got it. You can do this solo, but you have to jump back and forth between controllers. Yeah, this is a pretty basic space shooter. You're supposed to rescue these prisoners trapped in the purple confinement crystals when they appear, but you can't clear the level, it's all just about scoring points. Here we've got Alien Invaders Dash Plus! Exclamation point. A fiendish new dimension comes to one of the most popular arcade games of all time. If I had to guess what they're talking about based on this box art, I would say that this is a clone of Space Invaders, given the name. I wonder what the plus is though. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, this is definitely a Space Invaders clone. Fun fact, Atari was the first company to license an actual arcade game with Space Invaders for the 2600 and then later Pac-Man. So this is a knockoff, it's not a licensed product. Yep, it's a Space Invaders clone all right. The enemies just move back and forth though. Is the plus for the big alien at the top? Maybe it's because if you take a hit, you lose your ship but not your life. If you retreat to one of the bases, you can convert it into another ship and keep playing. The big alien always moves away from you the instant you hit the fire button. You can use this to your advantage though and spam the button to keep driving him into the corner. Shoot, he got away. There we go. Oh, and he's already back. Ugh, between the row of enemy shields and my base, it is tough to hit certain targets. Uh-oh, this isn't good. Leave me alone, you bully. Oh, and if you just hide under your base, the invaders never move any lower than this, so you're totally safe as long as you don't go outdoors. Not so scary now, are you tough guys? There were several other big box games for the Odyssey 2 as well, including Quest for the Rings, and this one is more Dungeons and Dragons inspired. Let's have a look. Once again, we've got the cartridge, and we've got tokens, and we've got game pieces, and we've got coins or symbols here. So we've got a variety of different game pieces. Okay, we've got a map. Oh no, this isn't a map. This, this is a keyboard overlay. This would correspond to where the uh, buttons are on the keyboard, so that's cool. This is the first time we've seen a keyboard overlay for the Odyssey 2. Very nice. Here we've got the game manual. Quest for the Rings. Prologue. Okay, so we've got some backstory here. The heroes. Haha, <laughs> the monsters, look at that. We've got a dragon, and then there's the computer representation. A spider, that's a spider. Some sort of pterodactyl, or doomed winged bloodthirsts, I'm sorry. The orcs, <laughs> orcs. The quest, so we've got more. We've got dungeons, infernos, shifting halls, crystal caverns. 
Yeah, this is really cool. Let's take a look at the game map here. Just like Conquest of the World, we've got a game board. Let's open it up carefully. It's really stiff. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we have a coordinate system along the side. We've got blocks in various locations. Yeah, really cool. This would have been really fun to play way back in the early 80s. I'm impressed. Electronic Table Soccer, a computerized tournament soccer table complete with invisible electronic lightning rods for super fast play action. Okay, I'm guessing this is a foosball kind of game, but I don't know what they mean by electronic lightning rods. So we better find out, that could be fun. Could have been, but isn't. The lightning rods just mean you control one row of players at a time by holding the joystick left, right, or center. Not sure how they decided on that nomenclature. At least there is an AI opponent, though it's pretty hard to score against. Here we've got another multi-mode game cartridge. It includes Armored Encounter and Sub Chase. I'm guessing these are also kind of clone games. Let's take a look here. Oh yeah, that's totally gonna be combat. There's no way that's not combat. And this looks like uh, Sea Wolf or Sub Hunt, something like that. Yep, pretty much like combat on the Atari with tanks and about a dozen map variations. Here, I've got the simple barriers, mines, and guided missiles turned on. There's no AI opponent, but that gives me a chance to practice steering the missiles. In sub chase, one player controls the plane and the other controls the sub. Both have guided bombs, but timing is still important as your craft never stop moving in opposite directions. Fun for a few minutes at least. Here we've got UFO, protect Earth from a sinister invasion of mysterious unidentified flying objects. Another Challenger series game and another space game. And it looks kind of similar to the other space games we've seen. I wonder what sets this one apart from all the other space games we've already looked at. Guess we'll find out. Okay, so there are two interesting mechanics here. The first is your shield. It will protect you from a hit, but it depletes when you fire your laser, so you have to pick your shots carefully. The other thing is that you can only shoot in the direction indicated by the white dot, which rotates around your ship as you move. That's it. That's the game. I do like the chain reactions that happen sometimes when enemies explode, though. And last but not least is Casey Munchkin, one of the most popular games for the Odyssey 2. How many munchies can your munchkin munch before your munchkin's all munched out? And there's four, five question marks. Judging by the box art, there is no way this is not a Pac-Man ripoff. And yes it is, it is totally a Pac-Man ripoff. Four different standard mazes, four different invisible mazes, and this is cool, you can even create mazes. So. That's something unique and novel, is that this game has a maze editor, something that probably hadn't been seen before, or there must not have been many games that had an editor function in 1981. So that's actually pretty cool. Nice little value add there. Create your own game boards. Man with a late 70s and early 80s rife with intellectual property theft. Okay, it's not quite Pac-Man, there are only three enemies instead of four, again due to the system's limitations. Also, the pellets wander around, making the challenge of navigating the maze somewhat different. Otherwise, yeah, the gameplay mechanics are the same. Enough so that Atari sued Magnavox. Remember the Pong lawsuit? Shoes on the other foot now. The lower court found the game was not substantially similar, but Atari won on appeal and Casey Munchkin was eventually pulled from the shelves. Here's the game's board editor. You can start from a handful of predefined playfields and then customize them. To remove a horizontal section, enter the grid coordinates letter first and hit clear. To remove a vertical section, 
Repeat the process, but this time with the number first. Adding a section works the same way, just hit enter instead of clear. Once we're happy with the changes we've made, we can play the board. This is a pretty cool addition and also a great use of the system's keyboard. Better than crypto logic anyway. Okay, maybe this one needs some work. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to point out a few differences between these two machines. This is the first one that I bought, and you can tell because of the damage to the plastic housing here, where a cord had obviously been stored touching the plastic, and that's a big no-no. Never store your cords touching the plastic because they will cause a reaction that eats into the plastic and cause permanent damage like that. Now I thought this machine was an earlier model based on the date codes on the chip, but as it turns out, this is actually the earlier model. And you can tell because it has this glossy smooth keyboard, whereas this later model has this matte textured keyboard. Other differences include the fact that the Odyssey 2 logo here is printed right onto the plastic, whereas the later model has it on a badge. And further, this one says Magnavox where this one doesn't. Internally, there's also a difference where this machine has its main board enclosed in an RF shield that's soldered together and everything is connected, including the RF modulator. This one has no RF shield and it has that bodge wire that we saw. No bodge wire on this earlier model. I suspect that the date code on the chip is because Intel manufactured all the chips in a single batch and then Magnavox used that single batch of chips as they made different variants of the system over the years. One other major difference is that this earlier machine has a non-standard RF cable that will not plug into a VCR or television. Instead, you need to use the switch box that comes with the system that plugs in like this, and then you can connect it to your TV or VCR. The later system that I have here uses a traditional RF style connector that I can plug directly into my VCR, and so I opted to use this one for all of the filming that I did because I get a higher quality video signal than if I used the switch box. If you want to know more, all the info you could ever want can be found at odyssey2.info. A link is in the description. Thanks to William for archiving so much fascinating history about the machine, and also for giving me permission to use his images and promotional videos in the making of this bit. I think that gives us a pretty good idea of what the Magnavox Odyssey 2 is all about. Did you ever play on one? And if so, what games were your favorite? Let us know in the comments. For me, I think the box art was my favorite thing about the system, but some of the games are surprisingly enjoyable 45 years on, despite the limitations of the hardware. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on RetroBits. <laughs>